this, when is this happening? There's a lot of people that have yet to find out what's going on with climate change and the local impact, our biggest local impact, which undoubtedly is sea level rise. Now, uh, speaking of communications, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Juliet Pinto here uh, from uh, the uh, Florida International University School of Journalism. And uh, we've been working uh, quite, uh, quite a bit uh, together uh, lately because um, I've been involved with uh, the Your Eyes on the Rise project. Uh, Juliet Pinto is an associate professor at FIU in the Department of Journalism and Broadcasting in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Dr. Pinto studies environmental communication in Spanish and English language media. Her award-winning documentary on sea level rise, South Florida's Rising Seas, aired in January 2014 and was repurposed by PBS NewsHour for their national newscast. She earned her doctorate in communication from the University of Miami, her master's in marine affairs and policy from the University of Miami's Rosen Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, and a, a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences from my alma mater's chief hockey rival, BU. Julia. Good afternoon. Um, in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, we're engaged in a number of initiatives focused around what we call student-led community engagement, dealing with sea level rise and its significance for South Florida or communities. Uh, we incidentally call this project Eyes on the Rise. What a coincidence. But yes, John has been involved with this, and we're very grateful to have his participation. Um, we see our students, we know our students, are the next mass communicators in journalism, public relations, advertising, and more on this issue. All of us here in South Florida are at the epicenter of it, and we see how our students benefit directly from being embedded with the politicians, the experts, the scientists, and everyone who is working on this issue. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, some of these initiatives. A group of four of the faculty at the School of Journalism, um, Susan Jacobson, Kate McMillan, Ted Gucci, and me, we developed an event last year around this time um, for King Tide Day, which is what we called it, when some of the highest tides of the year come. And we worked with Miami Beach in order to provide not only an amazing opportunity for our students to engage themselves and their communities around sea level rise, but um, also for all of you to actually see, because you know sometimes the science can be overwhelming, it can be abstract, but sea level rise and king tides are events that allow us to directly see what's happening in a very visceral way. Um, Mayor Levine participated, as did Mayor Lerner. The EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy was there. We had two US Senators, including our own Bill Nelson and others. Uh, we also involve our students in projects where they tell the story of sea level rise using humans, using non-experts by humans, right? But um, non-experts and experts, characters, people on the street. The documentary that um, John mentioned, Kate McMillan and I produced, it had a number of students involved from everything from videography to research to editing. It was the most watched online program for WPPT2 in all of 2014, and the second one South Florida's uh, Rising Seas Impact represented a semester's worth of work from Kate's amazing multimedia production students. The entirely student-produced web series it was based on was the most watched web series in WPBT2's history. We've also developed a sea level rise app. A sea level rise app, a project led by Susan Jacobson in conjunction with the FIU GIS department. Um, it initially began in the web GIS course that she developed, so also included students. This app is available on our website, eyesontherise.org, and it allows South Florida residents to type in their address and see their neighborhoods at different levels of sea level rise. And right now we're currently beta testing the second function of this app, which is to crowdsource flood reports with a number of classes this semester, together with groups such as the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Clio Institute, and others. And these initiatives 
allow our students to get ahead of the curve, to learn about and report on, for example, adaptation and mitigation strategies, be at the forefront and have the reporting expertise regarding smart strategies steeped in scientific and technical, technological knowledge that directly benefit local communities such as Miami Beach. We have also um, engaged in research examining national and international news content on climate change and other environmental issues, as well as held uh, focus groups to better understand communication happening around our own diverse communities. What we have learned is that there is a need for sustained news about climate change and its impacts, and a need for tomorrow's communicators to be steeped in this issue today. We have also learned that our students are ambassadors of this issue for their own families and friends who are learning from them. Our research into student involvement as media messengers has shown their immense interest in environmental science and in communicating changes to our landscape in ways that can't be denied. Our youth are really hungry to become involved in this issue. And finally, we are so thankful to have world-class partners working with communities such as Miami Beach who have been so generous with their time, as well as the FIU School of Environment, Arts and Society, the um, College of Arts and Architecture, the College of Arts and Sciences, the South Florida Water Management District, MAST at FIU, the Clio Institute, and many others. Because we know that the more that our students are embedded with the top experts in science and media, the better able they will be to professionally communicate these tough issues across media platforms over the next decades. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. You mentioned the Clio Institute twice. I, I should say I am a proud board member of the Clio Institute. Uh, you can look it up, uh, clioinstitute.org, and it's a grassroots organization uh, to educate folks about uh, climate science. As a matter of fact, Dr. Kurtman, uh, you're, you were often a presenter at the Clio Institute uh, um, seminars, which often take place at the University of Miami, and they're open to the public. And anybody, anyone can go, you can spend a day with uh, experts like like uh, Dr. Kurtman and, and learn uh, beyond sea level rise, uh, some, uh, some of the other uh, things about the state of the science of climate change. So we, we saw the overall picture, then we looked at some sea level rise projections, uh, then we uh, saw the possibility that these might be uh, worse than thought and worse than projected uh, by the IPCC. Uh, then we discussed how to communicate this to all of you, and now we're going to try to find out what to do about it. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to, to introduce uh, Mayor Levine, uh, the mayor of Miami Beach, who for almost 30 years, Philip Levine, has been an integral member of the Miami Beach community. Uh, he's established a number of successful Miami Beach-based businesses, creating hundreds of jobs for local and area residents while contributing to the city's tax revenue base. Currently, uh, Phil Levine is CEO of Royal Media Partners, an exclusive partner of Royal Caribbean Cruises. Uh, they handle the creation of all the media for Royal Caribbean International, celebrity cruises, Azamara cruise, uh, cruises uh, that are sailing the Caribbean and Alaska. Uh, Philip is actively involved with the Clinton Global Initiative, an organization that implements innovative solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. In 2010, Phil Levine was tapped by President Obama's Secretary of Commerce to serve on a task force advising on U.S. tourism. Through his work on the task force, Philip is working to strengthen the nation's growing international tourism industry, which in turn strengthens our economy. In November 2013, Phil Levine was elected mayor of Miami Beach. He received 50.48% of the total vote in a four-person race. My opening question to you, Mayor Levine, as mayor, you have the responsibility to prepare the city to climatic events which could disrupt public services and put your citizens at risk. Can you give us some examples of measures you're taking to minimize the consequences of global warming? First of all, do you ever, you're on a panel and you feel like the dumbest guy up in the panel? I mean, you forgot to mention my PhD from Harvard in hydrology and my master's from MIT. No, we have such an incredible panel and, I, and welcome you all to Miami Beach because what a brilliant, brilliant group of people that are with us today. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. Um, Mr. Consul General, thank you for bringing this to Miami Beach. Uh, 
Uh, we happen to have a French Consul General down here who's so active in our community. Um, he's brought, I mean, the answers to climate change, a great symposium. You know, we try to call Miami Beach now the Center for Creative Collaboration. And I believe that's what we're becoming. It's a great place to come, debate, discuss these ideas, and, and we get the world's attention. I always say whether it's uh, Justin Bieber, if he gets a DUI here, the whole world's going to know about it. But and, and also climate change, you bringing this to, to our city and having this wonderful event, we thank you very, very much because it's so important for all of us. Um, Commissioner Levine Cava, thank you for being here and all your efforts on the county commission. We appreciate your wonderful service. Uh, our mayor of the wonderful city of Pinecrest, Mayor Lerner, thank you again for being here with us. You know, when I, before I start telling you what we're doing and how we're doing it, I could tell you that we couldn't do it, we couldn't get it done if we didn't have an incredible team like we have. And that team is led by, by the way, he happens to have some great degrees. He's a Harvard undergrad, Harvard lawyer, our city manager, Jimmy Morales, who is absolutely a guy that knows how to get things done. And he's got a team of people from from Eric Carpenter to Bruce Mowry, and we also have uh, Beth Wheaton, who's sitting up here, who's ahead of our environmental sustainability, resiliency, who's brilliant and comes up with great ideas. We're also hiring a, um, a new chief resiliency officer, Susie Torriente, who's beginning. So, so to speak, we take this issue very, very seriously. I'm gonna tell you a quick little story. You know, my story was great until the end. So when I ran for mayor, but, but it's been a wonderful, exciting journey for two years. It feels like it's been 20 years. But when I ran for mayor, I saw what was going on in our city. We were seeing our streets flooded. We were seeing water during sunny days. Matter of fact, I think we cloned the name sunny day flooding. I think we should have patented that. When I ran, I, I put out a TV commercial. And I just want to tell you, because it's kind of symbolized what was going on. Uh, I'm leaving my office. And my assistant hands me a paddle and a raincoat. And she says, Mr. Levine, it's raining again, okay? And the next scene shows me paddling with the water pouring down. And my boxer dog, Earl, is sitting next to me. And I'm paddling, and I'm paddling. But then you see that I'm paddling down Alton Road, okay? And basically what I said is, you know, it's great to be the mayor, and I wanna be the mayor of Miami Beach, but I don't want to be the mayor of Venice, okay? And that commercial really went viral. Everyone started talking about it. And of course, as we know, um, some people I say get swept into office. I always say I got floated into office because this is an issue of our time. So I get elected. We see the problem. And by the way, when you become mayor in Miami Beach, you all of a sudden get like an honorary hydrology degree. You start learning about water movement. And we know that we have this issue. We assembled our entire team of engineers in, in my conference room and we sat around and we said, what are we gonna do? Everyone's been ignoring this for years after years. They hire consultants, there's analysis paralysis. Everyone's got an idea, but no one actually does it. No one gets it done. No one goes and does it and figures out how do we get the water off our roads? So we sat together and we said, here's our issue. And, it, and it's a simple thing, but it, it takes time and perseverance and fortitude. The water, as it rises in our bay, is coming up through our drains and it's flooding our streets. Why is that happening? Well, it's happening because the bay level is getting higher. And as all these scientists have explained to you, those are the reasons why. But when you're a mayor, the people of their city don't want to hear all the reasons why it's happening and why it's going to continue. What they want to hear is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to fix it? Matter of fact, I got a little hashtag called Fix It Philip. Okay, and I had it to live up to it. So we said, all right, what are we gonna do? Well, what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna pick our worst areas, the lowest lying areas of our city that we know is continually flooding and people complain about. Alton Road, West Avenue, the Sunset Harbor neighborhood. These are all areas, Western part of our city that continually flood. And we immediately went into action. We put in big pumps. Big pumps we started installing under the ground. We started raising roads. And you could see the look on people's faces when all of a sudden they see us raising roads. Matter of fact, the White House came down. We had representatives. They were watching us raising these roads. And by the way, 
when you're doing this, there's no playbook. There's no textbooks. There's no like how to protect your city for sea level rise. Uh, go to chapter four. There's no such thing. So we had all the questions. We don't have all the answers, but we have, and what we do have is a team that's going to get it done, that's going to protect the city. Put in pumps. We are raising our seawalls. We're changing our zoning to make sure that we have you know, less building structures on our single family home lots and more green space. We're building more parks. The big parking lot you see right across from uh, this convention center is gonna be turned into a six acre green space park. So it's all, it's all coming together, but what does it take? It takes time and it takes money. This project is gonna cost us $400 million. We're gonna put in 60 pumps. We had to raise people's stormwater fees to be able to pay for the first $100 million tranche. So picture you get elected to office, the first thing you tell people is, by the way, I'm gonna raise your rates. So now you have to explain to them, folks, this is not a matter of if, when, this is a matter of must. We have to do this. We can't let investor confidence, resident confidence, confidence in our economy start to fall away. We must take action. It was a little bit like World War II. I always said it was like we got attacked in Pearl Harbor and we needed to figure out how to fight back and put our team together. And that's what we did. So let me tell you the good news. The good news is last couple of days, some of the highest tide in recorded history. The good news is Alton Road was like the Sahara Desert. That's how dry it was. West Avenue was even drier. Sunset Harbor, where the residents were flipping out during this time of the year and they couldn't even walk across the street. I mean, literally they needed to put on scuba gear. Now it's almost like they never knew what, high, what king tides were. They never knew what high tide was. And that's good, but it's also bad. The good thing is it shows that our plan works. The bad thing is people start to have amnesia. They forget that we have a big problem. But this morning, we were able to kind of remind everybody, uh, this morning I was out on a state road called Indian Creek Drive that we had to shut down because water was coming over the seawall. Uh, I was honored to have former Vice President Gore with me and the two of us were walking around with our big high boots and we could feel the water, it was coming up, it was rushing up onto Indian Creek. So what happens is, is that that's a state road. So now what we need to do is convince our governor convince our Secretary of Transportation that we need to raise that road, we need to put pumps in that road, we need to build up that seawall. Because Miami Beach is a wonderful model for the world, but we need to show them that, that, that this can be done, that we need federal and state and, uh, and county help. Because I think Miami Beach is a, is a model for the world and we're gonna continue to be that way. Um, Folks, it's, there's no silver bullet, but what it takes is just perseverance, fortitude, raising roads, putting in pumps, raising seawalls, changing your zoning, and doing all the things that need to happen. But most importantly, making sure the community understands and the community has patience. Because let me tell you something, when those roads are under construction and that traffic is building up, everyone is saying, what the heck are you doing? But remember, we have a choice. We can live in Miami Beach or we can live in Atlantis. I chose and I choose to live in Miami Beach. Thank you. What's, what's your fee called again? The one you had to uh, impose at the beginning for getting the pumps done? Stormwater fee. The stormwater fee. So I'm going to borrow a line from uh, Rear Admiral David uh, Tiddley from uh, formerly from the Navy, now retired. Um, and, and you know, the U.S. Navy is very much concerned about climate change because the U.S. Navy knows, as almost all of our military knows, that there are some big problems, big conflicts coming up in this century having directly to do with climate change. And uh, Rear Admiral Tidley likes to say, we're going to pay a carbon tax one way or another. The residents of Miami Beach are paying a carbon tax because these pumps cost $400 million. And, and um, Mayor, I'm sure even you would admit that down the road, this is just a Band-Aid, right? I mean, several, several decades down the road, what can these pumps do to keep the water out? 
Well, first of all, I think we got a great 30, 40 year solution. But what I tell people when they ask me that question, I said, I believe in human innovation. If 30, 40 years ago, I told you that you're going to be able to communicate with your friend around the world by looking at your watch or with, or with a, with a iPad or an iPhone, or you'd have FaceTime, you would think I was out of my mind. And when human innovation and entrepreneurship come together and they invest in a problem, I believe in 30 or 40 years, if not sooner, we're going to have innovative solutions to fight back against sea level rise that we cannot even imagine today. Let's hope so. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dr. Kerman, you know, I want to throw a question your way because a lot of the work from the IPCC and from climate scientists around the world has to do with models. And, uh, you know, we heard a lot of model talk with this recent uh, non-threat tropical storm, Erica. Sorry, I call it a non-threat. I might be alone in that area, but, uh, and you heard me talk about models versus reality. And there's weather models and there's climate models. And a lot of people, Ben, will ask me, well, how can I trust these climate models that are forecasting weather, the weather 50 or 100 years down the road if your weather models can't forecast the weather for tomorrow? What should I tell those folks? It's a, it's a great question, John. Um, when we think about the differences between weather and climate, we want to think about climate is uh, the statistics of weather. So in terms of climate, you might ask, you know, um, what are the changes in the statistics for this winter's weather? Is it going to be a wet winter? Is it going to be a cold winter? Versus whether I can forecast whether it's going to rain on January 15th. So when we think about climate, we're talking about predicting the statistics of weather. And you know this from your own personal experience, actually. You know that in the summer, the storms are very different than they are in the winter. That's climate affecting how the weather behaves. It's affecting the weather statistics. And so we're just taking that one step further and saying, well, we know the winters are going to get warmer and the summers are going to get warmer. And how does that affect the statistics of weather? So yes, I can't predict the weather on January 15th, 2035, mm -hmm. but I might be able to predict a change in the statistics of the probability of some weather event, January 15th, 2035. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kazanov, I, I wanted to ask you uh, whether Miami Beach is one of those areas in the world that's seeing more or less sea level rise, because I know this is not a uniform uh, rise around the world. Some places, like for example, the Philippines, have tremendous sea level rise compared to other parts of the world. Can you expound on that? Yes. Uh, first of all, I, uh, you are lucky here because uh, the rate of sea level rise is uh, about the global mean. It's not higher than the global mean. So it could be lower. It could, would be better for you. But uh, uh, yes, in some region, uh, what we are seeing from, uh, seeing from uh, the satellite observation is that for the past 20 years, before we had no observation, no global observation. For the past 20 years, the Western Pacific, uh, Western Tropical Pacific and the Eastern Indian Ocean have been rising uh, faster by about four, ta uh, four times faster than the global mean. Uh, the regions most affected uh, are uh, Northern Australia, the whole Indian Indonesian uh, region, the Philippines, as you mentioned, and in the Philippines, uh, sea level elevated by 30 centimeters during the last 20 years, which is enormous. I'm oh, sorry, 30 centimeters in 20 years? Yes, in that particular region. What is the cause of that? Uh, we, we think it's, uh, it's uh, related to the fact that uh, during the last two decades, easterlies or trade winds, winds which are flowing from east to west in the tropical Pacific have been uh, have intensified. So they have pushed warm waters towards, towards the western part of the basin. So heat has accumulated there and giving uh, rise to higher sea levels. Do, do you think this, uh, in the case of uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan, might have played a role in uh, the destruction? Uh, I think uh, this is kind of typhoon is not really it's not directly linked to higher sea level, but 
as we have said before, the highest the sea level is, uh, the more uh, negative impacts uh, this kind of events uh, have on the coastal areas and population, of course. Right, that the base level of the ocean in that part of the world was already elevated, yes. and yes. therefore, yes. with uh, you know, regardless of the effects of, of uh, climate change on on typhoons, which yes. which are really uh, uh, kind of difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen with uh, typhoons uh, or hurricanes or cyclones but around clearly the world. This amplifies uh, the, the negative impacts, the temporary flooding. Uh, C correct. In these correct. areas. Right. Uh, what about other other coasts in the U.S.? I mean, can, the East Coast versus the West Coast. So what what we observe, at least uh, again for the last forty years. 50, uh, 20 years, sorry, 20 years, is that the eastern coast uh, of uh, North America uh, has been, uh, sea level has been uh, rising faster than on the western coast. There are a number of reasons for that. Again, the, the most important factor uh, of this regional variability is non-uniform thermal expansion. But other factors are also uh, acting in particular in the, in the northern part of uh, the eastern coast, uh, factors related to had nothing to do with climate, but uh, related to the fact that uh, the Earth is a solid body, uh, but it's not rigid. And uh, when uh, ice is uh, melting from a particular region of the world, in particular from uh, high latitudes, the ocean basin deforms in a very complex way. And uh, this causes locally or regionally a uh, higher sea level. And it, it is the case in the, uh, in the northern part of uh, east, the east coast uh, of America. So there is a combination of this solid earth effect and uh, thermal expansion effects, which give higher sea level in, mm -hmm. in this particular region. Yeah, I think I saw a note from the Capital Weather Gang, um, and they, they write on climate quite a bit too. And they, uh, they were talking about how around the Chesapeake Bay area, uh, there's there's a, a significant increase in sea level rise as compared to the worldwide average. And of course, you already know, I mean, if, if folks in Alexandria, for example, Virginia, just out, outside of uh, Washington, D.C., face problems with flooding of the Potomac quite often uh, in that area, and, and that, that is likely to, uh, to increase. Uh, Dr. Rignot, I wanted to ask you, I, I don't know if you mentioned in any of your slides, a lot of attention is given to... Uh, the glaciers, because it's such a uh, it's such an impactful visual when you see the before and after of uh, glaciers around the world that are receding at accelerating rates. However, uh, in in reading um, High Tide on Main Street, which is a book I recommend by John Englander, excellent excellent reading, very uh, layman terms of what's going on specifically about sea level rise, and he's a, he's local from Miami. High tide on Main Street. Um, that the contribution, if, if we were to melt all the land glaciers in the world, how, how much water would be contributed to, to the rise of, of the ocean? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, if we melt all the glaciers and ice caps in the world, we would raise sea level by about half a meter. Uh, the melting of the glaciers and ice cap actually is more of a problem for water resources, local water resources. If you think about uh, South America and the Andes, glaciers melting away in the Andes or the glaciers melting in Himalaya, the biggest impact for uh, these uh, countries will not be sea level rise, obviously, but uh, the lack of water resources year-round provided by the glaciers. Um, Glaciers, nevertheless, are very important to study. Um, glaciers in, uh, that's why I study glaciers in Patagonia and Alaska, because they give us a picture of what's going to happen to Greenland and Antarctica in the future. Uh, they are kind of ahead of the curve. We're seeing, we, we learn a lot of uh, physical processes by studying glaciers in Alaska that uh, would have taken a long time to emerge in Greenland and Antarctica because these are much colder environment, and, and these effects are not exacerbated like they are on mountain glaciers and ice caps. So uh, a half a meter in layman terms, about two feet, a little bit less than two feet if you melted all the glaciers in the world. So th that what that tells you is that, yes, these are impactful visuals, and they're a great proxy and representation of what's going on in terms of increasing uh, temperatures around the globe. But 
the real big concern is the West Antarctic ice sheet and Greenland and what's going to happen there down the road. And I, I might have some follow-up questions for you uh, uh, coming up in just a bit. Uh, Juliet, let me get you involved because, uh, you know, you and I are in the field of communications and I already expressed, you know, one of my uh, uh, stories from the trenches here as to whenever I, 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 I talk about some of these issues, people seem to be surprised. Um, this country in particular, as you know, has had a... Um, uh, a debate which perhaps uh, has gone beyond whatever what whatever it needed to be. <laughs> Those are my words. I'm not putting words in anybody's mouths here, but um, in 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 great part by a very well established and you can read about it just about anywhere you want uh, um, uh, deliberate misinformation campaign that kept. Americans generally confused over the last 20 or 30 years regarding the true state of the science of climate change. Um, so I wanted to ask you at the local, and even if you know of uh, some of the work being done at George Mason or at Yale, are perceptions changing locally and nationally regarding climate change? Um, what uh, I've looked at those surveys, they're wonderful nationally representative surveys done by Yale and George Mason University. And what they've shown, I believe they've been doing them for the past six years, and what they've shown is that the percentage of people who think that um, climate change is happening or global warming is happening really hasn't changed. It stayed around 60%, but neither has the percentage of people who feel like this is a really important issue. They just don't. They, they don't, it's way down on their list of priorities. And we've kind of delved into that. Um, some of my colleagues, Maria Elena Villar, who I see back there, um, we've been looking at um, climate change coverage and environmental news coverage and Spanish language news as well. That's obviously a big import for us down here in South Florida. And what we found, now our data set was from 2010, um, 2011, so earlier, almost zero almost zero. If it hadn't been for Hurricane Sandy in 2012, there would have been no mention whatsoever of the issue. Um, and we've also asked people, um, Mercedes Vigon, also a colleague right here, she and I worked on a paper where we, we asked, we asked Spanish language reporters, editors, publishers, you know, others why, and they said, you know, our audience just isn't interested. They're not interested. They're interested in immigration and the economy, so that's what we give them. Now, that's changing. We'll have to renew our research in that area, especially, you know, given what's been happening lately, the Pope, that was huge. You know, all of, all of these um, um, kind of events that are happening, and we've found, you know, news media are reactive. They will cover an event. They will cover when something, someone very powerful says something about sea level rise, but sea level rise is the ultimate incremental and invisible issue. It's very hard. Andy Revkin has a great term for this. It's called the tyranny of the news peg. It's very, very hard to get someone to sign off on a story about sea level rise when, you know, something blew up today or, you know, something else happened that, that is there and impactful and visual. So that's, that's a big reason why we want to get this going early on in journalism education for our students to teach them about the scope and the severity and the significance of this issue and how it's going to be the issue of their lives. And if they know how to cover it, they can build a career around this. Very good. By the way, it is co being covered today. Because we have, you know, we have everything converging at once, right? We've got the actual king tide or precursor of the king tide flooding our streets. We have the climate reality project going on at the Hyatt in downtown Miami. And we have this going on today. So at least our, our duopoly channels uh, 6 and 51 are covering it today. You saw the channel 51 people here earlier. And I think Jamie Garola is going to be here in just a little bit. Uh, you know, I... A couple of things I wanted to mention before we continue with some questions, and I do want to open, we have about 15 or 20 minutes, and I want to include some of you in all of this. Uh, so so uh, just a second, for, uh, first to mention one thing about the Pope's visit. Uh, the Pope uh, said very many things when he was here. And um, as the New York Times put it today, with a deft touch. Uh, but he said he was quite vigorous, I think. He was particularly vigorous about our common home, 
like he says, right? About taking care of the environment. He spoke a lot about how climate change and the extreme weather it can produce uh, uh, affects the poor and disenfranchised a lot more than it affects anybody else. So it's a big concern for him. I, I, I keep plugging my little uh, blogs, but I, I want you to look this up, up. The Pope and the Polyhedron, I wrote today. The Pope and the Polyhedron. This was a fantastic moment. He's in front of Independence Hall. Uh, I don't know if you were watching this speech. And, uh, you know, our, our chemist Pope uh, is talking about globalization. And to, as an analog to the right way, he said, because he says there's a right way and a wrong way to do globalization. As, as an analog, analog to the right way of doing globalization, he said, globalization should be like a polyhedron, not like a sphere. Now, of course, a polyhedron is many facets. Think of a bunch of triangles connected, making a big sphere, making a ball, all right? But what's special about the polyhedron is that each little area, each little flat surface has its own character. It might have its own color. It might have, uh, 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 well, the same shape, obviously. But there are different facets all across this polyhedron. And that, to him, according to his analogy, represents our countries, our cultures, our individualism, versus a sphere where all the points are equidistant. The entire smooth sphere is just one big world where there is no individualism and, and no regionalization and culture and so on and so forth. And I thought it was wonderful. So I used that as a stepping point for a little a 500 word, it's short as well, on highlighting some of the things he said quite vigorously about climate, our world, and the environment. So I invite you to look into that as we go forward. All right. Uh, if anybody's going to ask questions, I invite you to come forward in any of these two uh, um, uh, hallways here and what we'll discuss. But I, I want to get back to you, Dr. Rignon, because I have a, a, a yes, you, <laughs> because uh, I, I have, I, I want to ask you uh, about both uh, Greenland and the West Antarctic individually. Um, in, uh, what's going on in Greenland in terms of the ice surface? It's getting covered in soot. It's darker now. Is this true? And, and uh, are, are there any observations as to what it might be doing to the ice? Um, yeah, this, this, this topic uh, uh, would require off-the-line conversation. But uh, the, the matter of fact is that the, the reflectivity properties of the green ice sheet are changing with time. And that's also a factor that was not quite accounted in models. Um, Part of it is uh, the metamorphosis of snow, which changes as it gets warmer. So the albedo, the reflectivity of the main part of the green ice sheet is dropping. So it's absorbing more solar radiation. So it's melting faster. Uh, the presence of uh, debris at the surface of Greenland, the, the soot related debris. Um, I've seen the, the stories in the news. I, I don't believe that all of these are attributed to particles of carbons and, and, and human-induced uh, suits reaching the ice sheets. I don't believe that. Okay. I think some of that is uh, naturally blown dust from the periphery of the ice sheet, which is, um, you know, deglaciating. And when you deglaciate terrain, there's no trees or vegetation to hold the dirt around. Yep. So it blows on the ice more easily. Sense. So this is kind of a work on progress. So in other words, this is a process that might have been that might have always been there. The, the, the ice, the albedo of the ice decades ago might have been the same as it is today because of this uh, natural process of the dust? No, we do know that the albedo of Greenland is dropping. There's, it is dropping. There's a long record The albedo of is the reflectivity. So snow has tr a tremendously high albedo. Uh, that's why you need sunglasses when you're in the snow because the sun is really reflecting back on you. So uh, when, when the sun my albedo, ground does not absorb that energy, and therefore it just doesn't melt very quickly. Uh, but if you change the albedo, if you decrease the albedo and it's less reflective, uh, then more of that solar energy gets absorbed by the ice, the ice starts to melt faster, and these are some of the tipping points that we, we, we are so concerned about. Second part of my question before I go to the audience uh, about the West Antarctic, and I know this applies to Greenland too, but talk to me about what's going on underneath is the water warmer, the water that's surrounding the Antarctic or the West Antarctic and Greenland warmer, and what is that doing underneath the ice at the edges? 
Yeah, so I talked a little bit about that uh, on the slides, that um, all of these glaciers reach the ocean and they are in contact with warm waters, Atlantic water of subtropical origin around Greenland, and in the Antarctic, it's called circumpolar deep water. In the Antarctic, that warm water is only able to reach the coastline in certain areas. In some other areas, it's too far to be even pushed by the winds and reach the coastline. Um, in the sectors that are changing most rapidly in the Antarctic, like the Amundsen Sea or the peninsula, we know that the glaciers are bathing in that uh, warm water. Uh, we think, you know, the, the trouble with the studying the Southern Ocean is that the observational record is very short. It's very difficult to make assertions about what's happening in the Southern Ocean because there's not the long-term measurements. But we think that these warm waters are being pushed more towards the coastline because of the changing wind in the Southern Ocean. Um, the winds basically around the Antarctic are strengthening and this is the result of the cooling of the Antarctic from the depletion of the ozone and it's related to the fact that the rest of the world is warming faster than the Antarctic. So these stronger winds tend to push the subsurface water more into the, the glaciers. Is that what's causing the expansion of the sea ice around the Antarctic? I get a lot of pushback from folks. You know the Arctic sea ice. Uh, I mean, it's been all over the media. Uh, every This year, yeah. I think we had the fourth lowest Arctic sea ice cover on record. More importantly, the volume of the sea ice, it's becoming thinner and thinner. So coverage, geographical coverage is one thing, but the actual thickness of the ice is re being reduced tremendously in the Arctic. But then in the Antarctic, we've seen an expansion of sea ice. Is that because of the change in the winds? Yeah, it's a, it's a very small expansion compared to what's happening in the Arctic. And we have actually no record of the change in ice volume. So we don't know if the thickness of the Antarctic sea ice is growing or shrinking. This is very difficult to measure, uh, especially because the sea ice in the Antarctic is, uh, is thinner. It's covered by a thick layer of snow, and uh, it's very difficult to measure uh, from altimeters uh, the thickness of the ice. I think this, the... The debate is still ongoing about that. Uh, I think it's uh, related also to the changes in winds. The, that simple explanation I, I put forward uh, just a minute ago about the winds pushing the surface water towards the coast. Uh, the opposite effect of that at the surface is to push the surface waters away from the Antarctic and thereby expand the sea ice cover. Uh, so potentially these are all related to climate warming. It's just... Uh, 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 sea ice expansion is, uh, is is a complex problem. It does not involve just the winds. It, it, it involves the ocean, the atmospheric circulation, and the coupled system. So the debate is still out uh, about that, but it's not absolutely not incompatible with uh, climate warming as we know it. Who wants to ask a question? Yes, sir, and I'll relay it uh, on the microphone. Speak. Go ahead. Since then, I got involved in really drilling into the solution. I see in the uh, literature today where we talk about solutions. And I wonder if anybody on the panel is familiar with the underlying theme that seems to be running through all the literature. I happen to have the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report that was commissioned by UNEP in 1995, David Watson. And I was very disturbed at page 772 because when you really drill into the problem, they say, for instance, Whitaker and Lakens, they've estimated that an agricultural world of which most humans are peasants should be able to support five to seven billion. If you want to live at the North American standard, this study suggests one billion. In other words, the theme is that the population has exceeded the capacity of the biosphere. I know I'm getting way beyond sea level rise. I attended. Uh, so, what, our and your question is? If anybody here, can you allay my uh, fears that the real solution is going to have to be a drastic reduction in population? <laughs> Anyone like to answer the question? 
Yeah, no. The, oh, I'm sorry. So, so, so he's he's saying that the uh, the biosphere, according to some studies he's citing, uh, should only be able to support to Amer to American standards, in my understanding, one billion people. So the real solution is a reduction in population from seven billion to one billion, and he's asking the panelists whether they want to comment on that. It's not a moral solution, and it's also impractical. No, but uh, you know there are solutions to this problem. It's a challenge, and and it's a curable disease. It's not it's not an issue. The technologies can develop. We can change the way we live, and have the same number of people living on this planet. We just have to live differently. I would agree with that, but it's important, I think, to um, have population be part of the conversation. I don't think we can um, uh, just um, ignore the population pressure on, on uh, the consumption of natural resources as part of this problem. And don't forget, as you know, countries become more industrialized, they, they produce more carbon pollution and methane. So certainly population should be part of the conversation. I'm not sure a reduction from seven to one billion is the, is, is, makes any sense, but, but I do think that, that uh, population definitely should be part of the conversation, and it isn't uh, enough at this point part of the conversation. So this is what we're going to do at 7.58. We're going to continue the discussion until 8.15, okay? Uh, but Mayor Levine has a speaking engagement that he needs to get to. So <laughs> are there any questions specifically uh, for Mayor Levine? Go ahead. Um, for having the courage to make the difficult decisions that our citizens and residents who don't understand um, don't want us to make. Um, we could really use your leadership at Miami-Dade County. <laughs> and uh, I'm, ho I'm wondering if you would consider running for mayor in 2016. Oh. <laughs> First of all, I, I thought you liked me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very flattered, and I appreciate that. And I think that Miami-Dade County has some great leadership, some amazing county commissioners, and, and uh, I know Mayor Jimenez is, uh, there are a tremendous amount of constraints. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing about government. Everybody wants change, but when you give them change, they're like, well, we don't want that change, you know, and, uh, and I appreciate that. And I, and I, you know, I love Miami Beach. I love being mayor of Miami Beach. I have a re-election in probably 30 days, and I'm very excited to continue what we've started here because our job in Miami Beach we're only 10% through it. We must continue and make this city the model, and that's what I'm going to do. But thank you so much for your compliment and your and your question. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor, if you need to get going, we'll you, you can do that, and I will keep the rest of the panel here. Yeah, they know a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, though. For, thank you for, for hosting us. Uh, thank you for your participation as well. And... Uh, and uh, while, while he says goodbye, uh, Dr. Kurtman, I want to ask you a question. Uh, out of all the places in the globe, the past couple of winters, it's particular, uh, the Northern Hemisphere winter I'm talking about, there's one particular area that has had colder than normal temperatures, and that is the eastern section of North America, and the rest of the world has been much warmer than average. I myself anecdotally can tell you that over the last several years, yes, there's been a great deal of luck involved in us missing hurricanes here in South Florida, and it's more luck than anything else. Let me state that right now. We've been very, very lucky. But there's also been a very persistent trough of low pressure, a dip in the jet stream along the Western Atlantic or Eastern United States that has deflected hurricanes, particularly the Cape Verde hurricanes, northbound, and therefore we've missed out on uh, the, all the types of storms we, we, we had in the past. Changes in the Arctic, are they leading to possible changes in weather patterns around the world? Um, good question. It, and it's, it's another one of those that are, it's a little bit tricky. Um, there's certainly a, a collection of uh, results that argue that that is in fact the case. But uh, a little bit like um, Eric was saying with some of the things that are happening in the Southern Hemisphere, 
the jury, the scientific jury is still out about exactly why we're seeing this enhanced wavy pattern that, you, that you're referring to and why we, that enhanced waving pattern is producing uh, more cold outbreaks in the Northeast, deflecting hurricanes. So exactly why that pattern has set up is still a, a subject for scientific debate, but certainly one of the most compelling arguments at the moment is the changes in the Arctic are driving that, and those Arctic changes are related to climate change. Right, so the wavy jet stream means that instead of the jet stream blowing almost in a straight line from west to east, it's doing this constantly, and that is leading to colder outbreaks in spots, hotter heat waves in others, and the connection is that a warmer Arctic, uh, the, the Arctic warms a lot faster than the mid-latitudes, and you need a big temperature difference to have a strong jet stream. So if the Arctic is warming so fast, but the mid-latitudes where we sit are not warming as fast, there's not a big, as big a temperature difference between the pole and the other latitudes. The jet stream is therefore weaker. It meanders more and we get the patterns like, for example, the pattern that drew Hurricane Sandy onto the post, coast of New Jersey in a perpendicular fashion, which happened thanks to a very, JV, very wavy jet stream, not a JV wet stream. Um, next question. Uh, let's see. Let's go to that side. Thank you, John. Um, as you know, as an architect representing the American Institute of Architects and the Sea Level Rise Task Force, that we put together. I wanted to sort of make a quick statement and then ask a question about the scientists. As I um, speak as an architect, as an urbanist, as a visionary of our community, I see that there's always a lot of focus about the science and, and it's so important to communicate the science and for people to really get the level of concern uh, through the passion that you show uh, with your knowledge and the passion that the panelists have about the way the, the world is changing. My concern, and there was a statement by Al Gore today, was that urbanism and architecture really makes a difference in the way that we adapt you know, to this new condition that we have. And I can't say enough about how special it is to have a mayor and, and leadership in this town um, taking the kind of action, taking the kind of leadership with the kind of team that they have to really make Miami Beach the focus of the kind of adaptation strategies that we need to project into the future of cities, of coastal cities. And that, you know, sometimes in a way the media doesn't focus enough on the goodness of these strategies and how we're modifying zoning and public work standards. Uh, you know, my concern as an architect is really how I design my buildings tomorrow, how I go back out there and how I do what I do in a way that is more intelligent. And the only way that I'm allowed to do that is by changing the codes. So I really think that the focus has to go more towards, okay, how do we transform our cities so that they adapt better to something that is happening and, and perhaps not spend so much time, you know, convincing ourselves that this thing really is happening, but really spending a lot of time applauding political leadership that is so difficult really to sustain because of the cost, because of the criticism, because of how we are as a society that is so difficult, you know, for political leadership to stay focused and for their team and their consultants to really do what they need to do. And Miami Beach needs to be a, an example and a world leader in all these transformational adaptation strategies. So you can see my question really is not a question, but... Um, uh -huh. I figured there wasn't you know, a question but, in but, there. But as you know, developers who are really the city builders are really fearful of uncertainty. And the language that you all use all the time has a lot of uncertainty. So my question really is, how could we, in the scientific realm, bring more certainty to the fact that this is happening so that when we change a building code, we know that we're changing it for three feet in 100 years or 10 feet in 100 years because the science is so off and the uncertainty is so much that we really don't know what we're planning for. And therefore, that brings a level of kind of paralysis right. in the way that we plan our cities. So, so I'm going to weigh in myself first because I deal with forecasts all the time. And forecasts have a, a built-in uncertainty to them as well. And uh, there's a strong push these days for probabilistic forecasting as opposed to deterministic forecasting. You're, you're asking us to do a deterministic forecast of exactly how much it's going to be by what year. And, and that's not going to be possible. But I will tell you this. I mean, if, if there is a 3% chance that, uh, just a 3% chance, that in crossing uh, uh, Alton Road, you're going to get run over by a car, 
Even though it's just a 3% chance, would you cross the road? And the answer is no, you probably would not. And that's analogous to what we're dealing with here. Some of y'all's projections uh, do have quite a bit of uncertainty, but as you know, and now I'll ask you a question. You know, you talked about my passion. I'll ask you a question. Everything that's being done here and with a compact and in Miami Dade and so on and so forth is looking at the year 2060. And, you know, there's a two foot projection that the Southeast Regional Climate Compact is utilizing for the year 2060, and there's a 2.7 foot projection that the city of Miami Beach is using for the year 2060. Why are we not looking at what's going to happen beyond 2060? Why, I, you're gonna, I, know, I know you're going to tell me because the buildings are only designed to last 30 or 50 years. Is that your answer? No, actually not. And, and I've okay. given this a lot of thought. And uh, we participated in a Dutch initiated um, design thinking session here at the American Institute of Architects. I think I invited you to that. In fact, every time we have an event and I call someone like you, a friend, and say, hey, come and cover it. Uh, there's always some reason why you can't come. So I always sort of think that maybe we need to start staging murders at these events so you could get your news crews there, you know, but, true. but you know, hey, we're, we're peaceful people. We don't, we don't kill anybody, but, but it seems like the media only responds to blood, you know, and this yeah. is not bloody enough, you know? So uh, it seems to me that your question is valid because we in America design cities for 30, 40, 50 years in quality. In Europe, it's a little bit different. You know, we design buildings in Europe that perhaps are designed to last, you know, 200 years. But the fact is that we are now preserving Miami Beach and buildings that are close to 100 years or more. So we do have already a history of preserving our architecture in this community. So the challenge is to think that we're designing a building that has enough quality that we're going to preserve it. But the question of you know, how much do we design for? Do we design for three feet in a hundred years? I, I sort of feel it's a political question because, you know, it, it is so difficult to plan for this city 10 years, uh, uh, 10 feet in a hundred years. I mean, that some of these projections are so catastrophic that sometimes we sort of feel, well, we may need to retreat for sure from South Florida. And that's the kind of thinking that we as optimistic, you know, uh, inhabitants right. of this beautiful place. We don't even want to think about retreating yet, you know, but it seems like retreating, as John Englander may, yeah. may, may say in his book, is one of the options, you know, but right now we're thinking about how do we build a more resilient city for the future of the city, for the investors, you know, for the incredible real estate market that we're experiencing right now in this city. Anyone on the panel want to weigh in on this? Um, I'll just jump in quickly about the uncertainty. And as we talked about at the at the beginning, um, the uncertainty in science is part of the scientific process. It just is. And um, earlier, about you know, a decade earlier, there were certain groups, as we mentioned, that had stunning success in seizing on that uncertainty and turning climate change into a debate in the mainstream media in this country, even though, you know, there was very strong scientific consensus. So a debate was engineered with the end of um, injecting uncertainty into the minds of the American public who might not understand the scientific process or might want a yes, this is happening or no, it's not. And that's the definitive answer. And that's one of the challenges of environmental journalism and scientific communication is how do you communicate uncertainty in a way that makes sense and that you can continue communicating that uncertainty in a way that makes sense over time without people losing faith, losing, um, thinking you're not credible or, you know, otherwise not trusting the science, the scientific process, and ultimately the scientists. So can I just add one, one comment to that? Um, uh, and John actually touched on this point. Um, all of these projections and forecasts will necessarily be probabilistic. So to me, the challenge is, is getting the community that needs this information and the community that produces these probabilistic forecasts together to understand what these probabilities mean, to help define what the, pro the appropriate thresholds are and how to put probabilities on those thresholds. And so it's my belief that your community can develop under this uncertainty, can develop under these risks when they know what they are. So if we quantify the risks very carefully, we put quantitative estimates on things, I do think the process can move forward. And I, that's the challenge to scientists, and that's the challenge to you to, uh, to work with us in terms of developing what kind of probabilistic information you can use in your development process. Annie? 
Yes, I, I would like to add that uh, the, the, the elevation, uh, let's say, uh, by the end of this century will primarily, primarily depend on uh, the warming scenario, that is, uh, emission of greenhouse gases. Uh, if, for example, we, we continue to emit at the same rate as today, uh, in terms of global mean sea level will be, should be higher uh, than today by 75 centimeters. Uh, on, uh, on the other hand, if we uh, emit, uh, if we follow the two degree C scenario, uh, the one that is supposed to be adopted at the climate conference in Paris next December, uh, sea level will be higher than today by 40 centimeters. So I think for you, uh, 40 centimeters or 75 centimeters makes a lot of difference. So r really depends on on our emission of greenhouse gases in, in, in the future. Yeah. And one last thing that I want to add. You're right. I mean, resources, and I think we discussed this on Facebook perhaps, uh, our resources uh, at the news level are greatly diminished. The fragmentation of our audience combined with uh, the Great Recession have decimated newsrooms all over the country, and we don't have the resources to cover everything. But I am proud to say that according to Climate Central, I am the top communicator about climate change issues in this entire country because I do it on air and I do it on social media all constantly, and I'm proud of that. All right, we only have a few minutes left. Microphone, please. John Van Leer. Uh, here. No, City, uh, yeah, University of Miami. Uh, you hinted at the, the need to put a price on carbon. We're going to pay for this one way, one or, the way or the other. You can be absolutely sure there is no free lunch. And Citizens Climate Lobby has a plan called the Schultz Becker Plan which essentially puts a price on carbon that escalates rapidly enough that we can reduce uh, CO2 emissions perhaps 90% by 2030. And we ought to do this because it's much, much cheaper. In fact, we make money doing it. So look at Citizens Climate Lobby, and if you know a better way to reduce carbon, uh, I'd be interested to hear it from the panel. Thank you, Dr. Van Leer. Over here, yes. Yes, you. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, my name is Delaney and I have a question for Dr. Rigno. Um, I'm 16 and I would like to ask you about um, the IPCC's conservative estimates aside and your mention of one meter to five meters. Um, based on your research, what is your own best sense of how high waters will truly rise in my lifetime? And what would you focus on that society can do to materially stop future damage beyond what's already programmed into our oceans? Great question. Okay, thank you. Great question. So how much sea level rise in your lifetime, right? Uh, to summarize it. Well, I think any point of the finger of, on, on one of the issues is how much are we going to continue uh, burning, uh, is putting CO2 in the atmosphere. That's, that's, uh, that's a big issue. Right now, if you look at the IPCC curve, we are on the high end of this curve. We are in the mode, burn as fast as you can, right? So we're not in a mode where we reduce our emissions. And um, in, in, uh, in that case, the... Well, we're looking at a meter, maybe up to two meters sea level rise in the coming century. Uh, my concern as a glaciologist is that I don't want to see beyond that. I don't want to see the six to nine meters or even the 20 meters coming in our face. I don't think it's worth the experiment. It's not going to be fun. And uh, at that point, there will be no red button we can push on to say, hey, let's stop this. We want this experiment long enough. So we have to be smart enough about what we're doing on this planet and um, trust to some degrees those crazy scientists and their uncertainties to say it's probably not worth the risk to cross the road anymore. Um, I, I, I do believe that uh, a lot of that can be, can be changed by changing the way we live. At the same time, um, I know some people sometimes ask me uh, when is the tipping point? Have we passed the threshold? I think for the ice sheets, for parts of the ice sheet, we did pass that threshold already. Uh, we just went by so fast, we didn't even notice it. <laughs> um, 
So um, while I applaud all the initiatives of uh, reducing our carbon emissions and eventually coming to a carbon-free economy, I do believe that the problem will take us to the point where we're going to have to suck in back some of the CO2 uh, into the ground um, if we want to prevent um, some of the ice sheet sea level rise in the coming centuries. But we can do that. It's a, it's a challenge. You know? Technologies can be developed for that. Humanity faced even greater challenges in the past. This is just one of them. Great question. Good answer. Thank you. We are technically out of time. Uh, so I think we need to uh, wrap it up right here. And uh, I thank you all for your attention this evening. I think it's been a great, great evening here. And, uh, you know, feel free. We're going to have a reception now. Uh, there, the scientists are going to be around. Uh, you can ask them questions one-on-one. -on -one. I'm available, too, for a while. I do need to do the 11 o'clock news a little bit later, but uh, I'm going to be here for, for a bit. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you, uh, Miami Beach. Have a good night. <laughs>